<coughs> so, in the previous two lectures, we've looked at different notions of information. And we've seen that information can be related to the concept of entropy. We've also defined information. And an event has more information if it brings surprise to the person, uh, to the experimenter. Or in other words, higher information means higher uncertainty before you've made a measurement. Now, we would like to uh, look at today a few examples of communication protocols and then in the next few lectures we are going to combine our ideas of information theory and quantum communication. So today I am going to give some examples of communication protocols and would also like to exemplify how security and privacy are built into these communication protocols, can be built into these communication protocols. So we would like to discuss communication protocols and security. And one of the really promising things about quantum information and quantum communication is that it promises to give you protocols that are perfectly secure, that are fundamentally secure, and they cannot be broken by any classical means. But before we are able to do that, we should first be able to look at certain communication protocols in the classical realm and see how security is ingrained into those protocols. So the simplest example that we can come up with is, just to give you an example and motivation of uh, security, uh, generally what happens is that you want to send out a certain message and you encrypt that message so that the encrypted message or the cipher as it is called becomes difficult to decipher for any adversary. But when it reaches the intended recipient of that message, the intended recipient knows how to decrypt that message. So there is some kind of encryption that takes place. This say is Alice who wants to transmit information over a channel to Bob. There is some kind of message which this is Alice's world okay to the left of the yellow line is Alice's world Alice's laboratory or Alice's ecosystem and there is some plain text some message let's call this plain text P which Alice wants to send to Bob but Alice does not like to send the entire message as is to Bob because in between Alice and Bob's world there is this nasty world of adversaries, of enemies. Someone who would like to scoop that information. Someone who would like to eavesdrop, read what messages are being sent in, in a kind of adversarial fashion. So this is Eve's world in between. So there's really no point in sending the plain text out to Bob because then it has to intervene in Eve's world and Eve can listen to it. Eve can even corrupt the message so that the message that Bob receives it was not the intended P that was sent, intended to be sent in the first place. So what uh, Alice does is perform some kind of encryption and produces an encrypted message, a crypto message. Let's call that message C. That C travels, traverses Eve's world. Eve, attempt, Eve attempts to read out this message and from C, she would like to do a transform to get P. So the first transformation that is taking place is the encryption transform, C. C acting on P and this needs some algorithm of encryption. Okay. Let's call that algorithm K. K stands for key here. So P is an input 
and with the help of some algorithm, which is called the key, a new message is created, which is C, which differs from P. So the result of this encryption process is this crypto code, the cipher. C stands for cipher or the crypto code. This crypto code is then sent to Eve. And what Eve would like to do, Eve would like to take C and do some kind of algorithm, let's call it K prime. And she would like to do an inverse, sometimes C prime operation. And what she expects is that she gets some idea of what the message is P prime. And her goal is to maximize the overlap between P prime and P. That's what that's one kind of attack strategy. She would may like to read off the message. But another strategy would be that he would like to corrupt this cipher text. So whatever the case is, Eve is playing an adversarial role here. Finally, at Bob's stage, Bob receives C and with the help of this algorithm K, Bob tries to decrypt the message with the help of, uh, let's call that description process, also let's denote it by P. The end result of this is P. So this is an ideal scenario. This is encryption and this is decryption. So of course this algorithm has to be shared between Alice and Bob. They need to decide on what key they need to use. They need to get together at some point in time and decide that they are going to use this algorithm for encryption. So Bob decides to use the inverse of that algorithm for decryption. So they need to decide on the key. So this is a general scenario of how a communication protocol works. Now let me give you a simple, by the way, this idea of encryption is centuries old. In fact, it's millennia old. So in the Roman Empire, one of the earliest kind of ciphers was in the Roman Empire when the Emperor Julius Caesar wanted to came up with this idea of a crypto message in which each letter of the Latin language was replaced by another letter which was at a fixed distance from the Latin alphabet. Like a trans, this is called the Caesarean code. So an A is replaced, for example, by a C, B is replaced by a D, C is replaced by an E, and so on. So if this translation is three letters, or four letters, or five letters, and this is then decided between Alice and Bob. But this is easy to attack and spoof over, or because there are only 26 letters in the English alphabet. So this is one example. So let's come up with something more sophisticated, uh, which is a crypto code that has been used for some time. It's very simple, but it gives you the gist of the idea. And this is called a one pad scheme. Now the one pad scheme, suppose the plain text that Alice wishes to submit is given by a string of bits, zeros and ones. For example, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. This is the message, the plain text Alice wants to send. Now this could be a structured string, like the words of the English language. It could be a structured string, it's not random. Okay? Now, suppose Alice comes up with a key, K. The length of this string, say, is n bits. So, Alice comes up with a key which is also n bit long. Now, but this bit string is randomly generated. So, there are n bits, but there is some true random number generator which generates a sequence of zeros and ones, but it is a totally random sequence, ideally a true random sequence, not a pseudo random sequence, but a true random sequence, which comes from some physical process which is truly random like radioactivity. 
Now this k is some random sequence of, of bits, zeros and ones, totally random. Now what Alice does is that she creates a cipher text, a crypto code, which is really, so she can come up with some algorithm. This algorithm could be as simple as taking the exclusive OR between the plain text and the key. So if I were to take the bit wise exclusive OR, 0, 1 gives me 1, 1, 1 gives me 0, 1, 0 gives me 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. Now if this key is totally random, then this cipher text will also be totally random because the randomness of this key is going to bleed into the randomness of the crypto, crypto message. So one key requirement is that the key must be random, totally random. Now instead of sending P over the channel, which is a classical channel, which is a public channel, public channel means everyone can listen to this. It's like a broadcast channel. Alice can listen to this, Bob can listen to this, Bob is the intended recipient, but all other parties, all other teams, eavesdroppers can also listen to this. But this message goes out to Bob. Now here is Bob's word. Bob's labs, Bob's ecosystem, this is Alice's <coughs> ecosystem. Now in this ecosystem, in Bob's world, Bob receives this crypto message and he knows what the key is. So we'll come to some limitations of this one time pattern scheme, but he knows what the key is. So he takes the key, exactly the same key, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, takes the incoming message, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and then tries to recover the original plain text by once again taking the exclusive or addition modulo 2 of the received crypto message with the key. Now if Bob were to do this transformation, 1, 1 gives me 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Is this the same as the original plain text? Yes, it is. So Bob has decrypted the cipher text and recovered the original message. Now what are the assumptions? Is this a secure crypto scheme? What are the limitations of this? Why is it insecure? What are what would make it secure? Right. First of all, the key needs to be totally secure. The key should not be shared with anyone. So that's one of the key limitations of the one parent scheme. So, first of all, key must be secure or private, which means only Alice and Bob should know what the key is, correct? What are the other limitations of this one pair scheme? Yes? Right, so the key must be at least as long as the message, right? It scales linearly with the size of the message. And yes? Right, so, so this means the K includes what the key is, what the sequence of strings is, and how do we implement it. So key is everything, it's a process as well. Right, so it cannot be reused 
every time a new message has to be transmitted, a new key has to be generated, right? Because if the same key is used over and over again, it might be suspected that Eve might spoof forward the messages and try to recover what the key is, what the key looks like. So in order for pure privacy and security, the key has to be rehashed each time a new message is sent out. The fourth thing we've already mentioned is that the key must be truly random. There should be no pattern inside the key. Otherwise, the ciphertext will have some pattern. For example, if there is a pattern, uh, the hijacker may try to decipher some of the text. For example, in the English language, when you use the letter Q, I think in most cases a U follows a Q. Quail, Q, Quagmire, Quarantine. So whenever there is a Q, there is a U that follows this. So there are patterns in the English language. Right? T, E, in between there has to be an H in most cases, I think. So we don't want any pattern to leak into these crypto text because then Eves might have a chance to decipher what the message is. So the key must be totally random. So these are some limitations of of this one plan, one time uh, one bad scheme. Okay. The major problem is how do we generate the key? Now one possibility is that Alice and Bob meet at one point in time they have converged at one location and they generate a long, long list of keys and then they separate the partition and then they use those keys subsequently in time. But they met at one point in time. When they met, why couldn't they share the message in the first place? Right? So this problem of distributing the key is important. And that's what leads us to the idea of quantum key distribution. So the main thrust is to keep the keys secure and distribute the keys in such a fashion that it's very hard for an adversary to latch into the message. There was a question somewhere. Yes. It could be anything. Any alphabetic text or numeric text. Right. So it could be, but what we're doing is we're putting this into a binary code, like the ASCII code of English language, but P could be anything. P should not be limited by the kind of things that you want to transmit. P is the message. What's inside your heart you want to transmit. There's no limit on that. Yes. And sir, the key has, the Alice key randomly generated, can it also be shared with Bob? Or Bob will share it with Bob randomly generated? No, no. If they share random keys on their own, they will not be correlated. So these keys must be identical. So there has to be some mechanism of sharing the keys, either over a channel and making that channel perfectly secure. That's what quantum key distribution does. It uses a quantum channel, which is called an entangled qubit, qubits. Or they have to meet together and decide on what the keys are going to be. But those keys have to be generated randomly. So they must converge on, on these keys have to be identical or they must have decided an algorithm that if this were the key, I could do a mathematical transformation on this key to get my key. But that is really meaning that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two keys. Yes. This should be totally random, so it's like a coin toss. This can have some structure because generally messages have structure, but the key has to be totally random. So it must come out. So this does not. So you need to find out the entropy of this message. To if that entropy is one, it's totally random. So things really become more clear if this n is long. If n is long, you can tell. Look at the frequency of the ones, the frequency of the zeros. And you could also look at, analyze if there are any patterns in this. Really, you would like to look at the entropy of this message.
to determine that this is a truly random key. Now, how do we get around these problems? So, there are different mechanisms. First of all, let me give you a logical idea. One idea would be the following. So, if Alice, suppose Alice has access to a box and Alice puts the message inside the box, the scroll, the message inside the box. And Alice then locks the bo box with a key. This is Alice's lock, lock and key. <laughs> Now, what if this only Alice possesses this key and she does not share it with Bob? What she then does is, so the yellow represents Alice. Alice can only unlock this box and open up the message and see what's inside. Now, but this message has to be transmitted to Bob. One mechanism is that Alice sends this box to Bob. Alice's key is Alice. <laughs> now, this is locked, right? But the key is with Alice. And the message is inside. And Bob has no chance of opening this box because he doesn't know what the key is. So what he does instead is he there's another lock inside the box and Bob has his own key. Those keys could be totally different from one another. So this is Bob, Bob's key. So Bob locks the box on his own end. So it's locked once and it's locked once again. And then this box goes back to Alice. So it enters Alice's world again. And when it has entered Alice's world, there's already Alice's lock and now it has Bob's lock on it as well. And Alice cannot open Bob's lock. But she can unlock her own lock because she does possess the key. So what she then does is she sends the box back to Bob. So when this box comes back to Bob, it doesn't have Alice's lock anymore. It just has Bob's lock, but Bob does possess the key to unlock it. So uh, she unlocks this and opens up the message and reads the message. No key has been shared between Alice and Bob. They have their own keys and they keep it separate in their private custodies, in their own worlds. They don't share it with the public. But this requires three transmissions on a public channel. Three transmutations between Alice and Bob. This is one disadvantage of this. Now an idea which, uh, this can also be uh, formulated mathematically. Now there is a crypto stream that does this. It is slightly more advanced and I am slowly getting the RSA crypto scheme. Which is commonly used in e-commerce these days. But before we are able to do that, let's look at the most at a simple example. But in order to come to those examples, I need some kind of uh, lightning fast review of number theory as it applies to cryptology. So I have compiled a list of few definitions and a few background stuff, which is kind of nice, which I would like to share with you. Quickly, yes, please. Is, is, is case, has the message been 
Yes. So this this key this is a conceptual illustration of what's happening. The key can interfere with the message and encrypt it in the real in the real world. That's what we're going to see right now. Okay. But this is just a cartoonic representation of the idea. In this idea, Alice and Bob don't share a key. They have their own keys. They can generate their own keys by some mathematical algorithm, some complex mathematics can generate keys and they keep it themselves. And it's very hard for the public to find out what the key is. That's what generally current public cryptography systems work in that fashion. All right, Ali? Yeah. Now, uh, let's uh, look at some lightning fast review of number three. First of all, I think you all know what division means. So if a number A is being divided by B and A is greater than B, then the result might look like Q B plus R, right? Where R is R is called the remainder, A is being divided by B and Q is called the quotient. We have seen this. And if R is 0, this means A is completely divided by B or B completely divides A or A is a multiple of B. Remember A is bigger than B in this expression. If B completely divides A, this is the symbol for this. You have seen that when we are discussing the short factoring algorithm perhaps. The second idea is, we all know what a prime number is, P, okay? Uh, P has only two factors, one and the number itself. And we also, another kind of neat idea is that any, any integer, greater than 1 and we talk about positive integers here can be expressed as a product of two primes this is a fundamental theorem of arithmetic any number n can be represented as a product of two primes p and q are primes Now, I would also like to invoke the idea of a co-prime. We've already seen co-primes. Two numbers are co-prime with one another. So, if I have numbers A and B, these numbers are relatively prime to one another or co-prime with one another if the greatest common divisor of these numbers is 1. Right? So A and B are co prime. For example, 12 and 7, they are co prime. All right, so then I would like to define Euclid's, uh, Euler's, Euler's phi function. Let's use this part of the blackboard. Euler's phi function. So if I have some number n, some number n, the Euler's phi function of that number is the number of integers less than n which are co-prime with n. 
So the number of integers less than n, which are co prime with n. So if P is a prime number, if P is a prime number, what is the Euler phi function for a prime number? Sorry? So this is the number of integers. How many integers? This is the number of integers which are less than p, which are co prime with p. All of them. All of them. So, what is this answer? Yeah. P minus 1. All the numbers less than the prime number from 1 up to p minus 1, they will be co prime with p. That's how we define a prime number. So, now what we would like to uh, then I would like to so there is another kind of nice result in this Euler's phi function thing is that if I have two numbers m and n, I take the product of these numbers, the Euler phi characteristic of these numbers is the product of the Euler phi characteristics. Okay, and this is really useful for RSA crypto systems. Okay, so you just need to remember these results. Now I would like to give an idea of congruences. Two numbers are congruent mod some number n if a minus b divides n. For example, if you talk about mod 6, 5 and 11 are congruent. We have seen this. So, 5 mod 6 is equal to 11 mod 6. So, in modular 6, arithmetic 5 is equal to 11. In other words, this result can also be written as a equals some number k1 integer b plus r and b equals some integer k2 b plus r where the two r's are identical here, two, the remainders are identical here. So this is the same as what I have written over here. Modular 3 in modular 10 arithmetic. 7 is the same as 17, okay, same as 27, same as 37. And we see many examples of this when we are discussing Shor's factory. Alright, so this is the idea of congruency in modular arithmetic. Now, uh, Okay, now I would like to talk about Euler's uh, theorem or Fermat's little theorem. So Euler's theorem.
what this theorem states is that if I have two numbers a and n and if they are co prime that is the greatest common divisor of a and n is 1 then a raised to power phi of n equals 1 mod of n. Alright, so this is a theorem. Now, if, if n were a prime number, n were a prime number, then any a less than the prime number will be co-prime with the prime number. Alright, so this means that if a were, if n were a prime number, then a raised to power phi of p, which is a raised to power p minus 1, is 1 mod of p. So if I take a prime number, and a is less than the prime number, if I put p minus 1 in the exponent, and a here, the result would be equal to 1. For example, p is, let's say, 3, it's a prime number. So, a, let's choose a equals to 2 raised to power p minus 1. 2 raised power 2 is 4, but in mod 3 this equals 1, right? So this is also an important result, but this is just a special case of a Maxwell theorem. The last thing I would like to mention as, as a build-up of cryptology is the primitive roots. A primitive root mod of P. Now P is a prime number. When I write P, it means a prime number. Now, an integer g, an integer g is a primitive root mod p if g is power a mod p gives all distinct integers from 1 to p minus 1. Let's see. <laughs> for a uh, gives all distinct integers for a okay so this is how we define the primitive root mod p okay so first of all let please write this down and I'll explain this with an example If G is a primitive root mod P, then G raised power A mod P gives me distinct integers 
distinct integers for a varying from 1 all the way to p minus 1. And since it's mod p, all those distinct integers will also be between 1 and p minus 1. Now let's look at an example. The other thing that we need to know is that if p is a prime, then there will be phi p minus 1 primitive modes of mod p. There exist phi p minus 1 primitive modes of mod, mod p. Okay. For example, <coughs> let's look at the number 30. Our number is prime and it's 30. The Euler phi function for this number is p minus 1 which is 12. Oh, I'm 
sorry, I'm sorry. So we are finding the primitive roots mod of 13. Finding the primitive roots. So we are finding primitive roots mod of 13. And the number of primitive roots mod of 13 is 5 p minus 1, 5 of 12. So those roots are, so there are four such numbers which are less than 12, which are co prime with 13. So they are 2, 5, 7, 11. There are four of these. So this number turns out to be 4. So there are four primitive roots mod 13. And there are 2, 5, 7 and 11. Got it? So let's backtrack a little bit. Right. So we want to find a primitive root mod of a prime number 13. In our case it's 13. So those primitive roots are g. And how do we define them? And if we take g and raised to the power of a, where a runs from 1 all the way up to p minus 1, then you get distinct integers. How many such g's exist? How many such g's exist? That's given by this formula. That is given by the Euler phi function of p minus 1, phi of 12. Okay, so we need to find numbers. Oh, have I defined this properly? Co prime. So, right, so we need to find out the number of primitives. Right, so the number of primitives mod 13 will be given by Euler phi function of 12. So we need to find out the integers less than 12, which are co prime with 12. Now, what are they? They are 1. 2 is in co prime with 12, 3 is in co prime with 12, 4 is in 5 is, 6 is in 7 is, 8 is in 9 is in 10 is in 11 is, is. So there are 4 values of g, 4 primitive roots mod 13, 4 of these numbers exist. Alright, and those numbers are 1, 5, 7 and 11. Alright. 
Now what we could do is we could take any of these numbers. So let's say we take this g. This is our g. Then if we take the powers of g, so we want to find g a mod of 13. So we take this g and vary a from 1 to 12. So we take this 7 raised to power 1, 7 raised to power 2, 7 raised to power 3, 7 raised to power 4, 7 raised to power 5, 7 raised to power 6, and then 7 raised to power 7. 7 is power 8, 7 is power 9, 7 is power 10, 7 is power 11, 7 is power 12. And do this uh, exponentiation modulo 13. We will get 12 distinct integers between 1 and uh, 1 and 12. Alright, so this of course is going to be 7 mod 13. Everything is mod 13, so I don't want to write this again and again. This of course is going to be uh, this thing here a this part p minus 1. This is the same as this thing, this is going to be 1. So all the numbers between 1 and 12 will appear here. And all of them is going to be different. That's because 7 is a primitive root mod 13. So how do you find the primitive root mod of a prime number? You take the Euler 5 function of one number less than the prime. So you take 5 of 12. And there are 4 such numbers which are co-prime with 12. 1, 5, 7 and 11. So you pick any of these g's. <coughs> Alright, so this generates, so this is how we define a primitive root mod of, of a prime number. Now what we would like to do next is, so by the way this is trivial, this is trivial. If I take a g and exponentiate it to one less than the prime number, the answer is one and this is known to everyone. This is also trivial. Now what we would like to do is, we would like to come up with a key distribution scheme that uses all of this, or some of this. Yes. So, g's are selected to be greater than 1, between 2 and p minus 1. So this is how we define. Uh, now, uh, let's look at uh, a key distribution scheme between Alice and Bob, which is as follows. Now, uh, I, I probably this will take longer, but let me just uh, give you an example of a one-way function. If I have g, some primitive root mod p, and I raise it to power a, and this a is greater than or equal to 2 and less than or equal to p minus 1 or less than p minus 1. And if I take the mod p of this, and if this is some number, some integer a, like the, one of the integers that we get here, if I knew g, and if I know A, is it easy to find capital A? It's quite easy. So you just, I, I know G and I know A. It's straightforward to determine capital A. However, if one is given capital A and one does know what G is, 
it might not be trivial to find out what small a is going to be. <coughs> this is hard, computationally hard. It's computationally complex, and it's actually like finding. This is called finding the discrete log <coughs> of a. So the discrete log of a to the base g is small a mod p. So finding discrete log is not easy. It's not as easy as finding this direct exponentiation. It's like a hard problem. So if you have two numbers and you want to find out whether they are prime factors of a composite number, it's easy to do. But once you have a composite number, it's very hard to find out the prime factors of that number. So this is called an NP hard problem, which, which is really one way. One way it's easy. The computational complexity is low. The other way is very hard. The complexity is hard. So this kind of problem, a discrete log problem, probably some of you are doing their project on this as well, is hard. So if one when to know G and A, which are in the public domain, it's really hard for the university to find out small A. Therefore, you send out messages G and A, capital A, <coughs> to the public to the public sphere and then expect a really clever mathematician or a really strong computational powerhouse to determine the discrete log of that capital A with respect to G and find out what small a is which is the key which is the key. So most cryptographic schemes are based upon these one way problems which are hard to solve in one direction. So, so you throw out the throw out uh, G and A into the public, and expect that there is no computer, no cleverness, no intelligence can match the power that is required to find out the discrete log of this capital A with respect to base G, and this small A is then going to become the key. Now, what I'm going to describe in the next lecture is a mathematical reformulation of this problem in which. Keys are not shared, really not shared between uh, two systems, but they are generated individually by Alice and Bob. Okay, and this is going to use all of these small tidbits in the number theory that we uh, that we discussed today. Okay, inshallah, see you on Wednesday.